This is a story of how humanity and technology meet that has multiple facets. Munjid will share his experiences and some extraordinary images before a Q&A session in the last 15, 20 minutes of this hour. Please welcome Associate Professor Munjid al -Maderis. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for having me here. And um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's really an honor to be presenting in front of you all. Normally, I give talks without PowerPoint, but um, because it involves some technology, um, so I made a PowerPoint presentation uh, or a keynote. I was born in Baghdad. This is my father, and that's myself in that uh, pram. And you can see um, Iraq was not that bad. We did have um, you know, rocky things, and, um, um, and believe me, Baghdad was a beautiful city. Uh, that is a picture I was taking uh, in the 70s about um, uh, Iraq and Baghdad. We did also have fireworks. They were pretty much similar to Sydney fireworks, except they were real planes being shot by real missiles. Um, so I grew up normally, as uh, uh, you can describe it, in, in a war-torn country. However, um, I watched The Terminator at the age of 12, and um, uh, ironically, I didn't understand the movie, obviously, uh, because the whole idea about The Terminator is not to make Terminators, but uh, I had this passion about making half machine, half human. So that's why I pursued my dream to um, um, go to medical school, and I managed to do that. And um, I graduated as a doctor, and I was very happy. I never thought about leaving Iraq, and um, um, I was very similar to millions of Syrians uh, when I visited Damascus in 1996. Um, Syrians were very happy in their country, and look at them now. Uh, there are 10 million of them outside. Uh, a lot of them are refugees in Iraq, um, sadly. So. Um, that moment that changed my life is when I refused to do this. Um, Saddam Hussein ordered us to um, amputate um, army deserters' ears, and um, um, so I couldn't do that. And as a result of that, I had to flee outside Iraq. Um, um, funny enough, one of my peer, one of my colleagues, asked um, a friend of mine if that's true, that Saddam did that to people. So I felt very insulted, actually. And I'll send him this picture. Um, so I ended up coming to Australia on a boat. Uh, the journey was very rough, and um, eventually I um, uh, got to Australia as a new arrival. And uh, that was my home for several months um, in Curtin Detention Center. And uh, the first thing happened to me in Detention Center was um, being called, changed my name to 982. And um, I was marked with a permanent marker on my shoulder with that number. And uh, I was a naughty person, and uh, I caused a lot of trouble to the Department of Immigration. So as a result of that, um, I visited many Australian prisons. And let me tell you, Western Australian jail system is fantastic. It was absolutely <laughs> nice. But I had access to a phone, so the Department of Immigration didn't like that, so they put me back in the detention center, this time in this box. It's called the suicide watch box, and um, I spent many days there. But eventually, uh, I was released, and fast forward moving uh, to that life, and um, uh, my life changed upside down, and um, I became uh, a celebrity. All of a sudden, I get invited by Her Majesty the Queen to uh, visit her in Windsor Castle, and Prince Harry didn't even bother seeing Tony Abbott with his big ears, and he came to see me in Macquarie University. Um, and that's all because of what um, uh, we developed, which is uh, a technology that is called OSI integration. And I do apologize if some pictures will look um, um, uh, a bit confronting. So the technology is um, very simple, if you think about it. It's basically um, making a cut on the leg and um, inserting a titanium rod inside the, the bone, rejigging the muscles and nerves to operate a, a robotic prosthesis. Um, it is um, an idea that um, uh, basically developed many, many years ago. This is a, a, a mandible of a, a Mayan uh, person uh, from Honduras, and um, the three front teeth, as you can see, they're made out of ivory, and people thought that it was a ritual uh, to make um, dead bodies look um, uh, normal. Uh, but then in 1972, a person uh, by the name of Amadeo Bobillo um, 
managed to do an X-ray of this uh, mandible, and he discovered that the bone has healed over the ivory. That was the first evidence of OSI integration technology. From there onward, um, uh, the technology has evolved to um, uh, perform tooth implant, um, um, and dentists, with my admission, are way ahead of doctors and surgeons uh, all the time. They're always ahead of us. Uh, they invented cement, they invented implants, they invented a lot of things that um, uh, we follow many years later. Um, so we took the technology and um, uh, developed it to um, uh, be used for amputees, um, basically. And um, these are images of several of my patients that um, um, I 3D modeled um, um, uh, implants for based on their anatomy to fit their uh, residual limb and utilize whatever they have um, in order for them to, um, uh, to be able to mobilize again. And that's what is the end result. You can see uh, these are extreme um, um, kind of cases where you can see on the uh, uh, right hand side is Darren who's um, lost both limbs above the, the knee and if he's wearing long pants you won't be able to identify that he's an above knee amputee. And um, uh, Stephen on the other side is um, using biome legs and uh, he walks almost normal uh, basically with both uh, prostheses. And the whole idea is to give people um, the ability to mobilize again. And I dare to say that now for an above knee amputee, this technology bring their mobility back. And for a below knee amputee, this technology give them their leg back, uh, basically. And um, people are running, doing all sorts of um, activities. Um, these kind of activities such as rowing, such as speed uh, cycling cannot be done with a socket prosthesis um, because the socket falls. And um, my patients go to the extreme where they uh, attach their prosthesis to flaps and things like that and, um, and use it for uh, diving. What we discovered with this technology is that uh, people regain the ability to feel the ground. and. Um, um, they can feel what they're walking on, and there is no excuse anymore uh, of uh, stepping on your partner's toes. Um, then um, uh, human beings get bored with things, so I, I'm, I'm a person that get bored after 10 minutes, so I started thinking about doing something else, and um, um, a more challenging um, avenue, which is um, this time growing limbs. Um, people who have no limbs or very short limbs, so we designed this kind of technique by inserting a magnetic rods that expand, and um, uh, this is an example of a patient where has a very short uh, femur, and we grew a leg for her, basically. And you can see uh, with the challenges that she had, both uh, both legs amputated. She has a leg now that she can walk uh, with, and that's her seeing her yesterday here in Perth, uh, basically walking unaided and giving her her mobility back, um, basically. This is the most challenging case that I faced, which is a 21-year-old young girl who had hardly any bone left in her, um, uh, in her hip. And um, as you can see how small it is, though I came up with this idea where I, I cut the bone um, between the uh, lesser and the greater trochanter and then made a hole in it, and then hook it up to a, an expandable device and then hook it up with some plates and screws and cables and then sign it so nobody can steal the idea. And then... <laughs> And then there you go, um, uh, with, the, with, the, with the help of um, a few um, prayers from uh, people that are, have connection with God, it did work. As you can see here, there's a lot of bone that grew, and this lady um, developed a leg, basically. And, sorry, that was uh, back. And that, that was her first steps ever in her life. She lost her limb at the age of one basically. And then that became boring as well. And uh, we moved to a new technology now. And uh, now we're thinking about upper limb uh, people who have no, um, no arms. So um, um, I'm not an inventor of this technology, but I'm one of the people that are using this technology. And uh, it's called target muscle re-innovation. And now what we're thinking is that uh, we have robotic arms and we make the brain control it, uh, basically. So we rejig the, um, the nerves that have been cut um, with the amputation and uh, re 
move them back to muscles that are not utilized anymore, and they make them amplifiers, and then we hook them up with electrodes, um, and uh, that connects to the, um, to the robotic arm, uh, basically. And with time, the brain uh, start thinking that these muscles are the robotic arm, and um, the patients start thinking that they have an arm back again. And this is an, um, an extreme example. You can see this young chap is an Iraqi soldier who uh, lost his limb fighting ISIS. And you wouldn't believe it if I tell you that this is half an hour after he was fitted with this arm for the first time ever. And um, that's in Baghdad, basically. So um, um, the whole idea is to... Um, um, pass this technology to people who need it at most, people who cannot afford it, basically, in, in areas where there are a lot of um, uh, wars. And um, look, at, look at how excited he is uh, trying to use his arm. That's the next day, uh, basically, and he learned very quickly. So that takes us to another level where um, facing challenging um, cases with ethics. Um, and. Um, what we do is really outside the box, and it's really cutting edge technology. So that creates a lot of problems. Um, first problems happens with peer. Uh, people who do not want to move and do want to put, want to uh, push the boundaries and think that uh, technology should have stopped in the 18th century. And, um, and they would be the first people to write letters um, to the Department of Health and telling them that I should be um, you know, deregistered. So this is an example. This is a 75-year-old gentleman who um, is di diabetic and uh, he's a vascular patient. He's past retirement and um, um, he had a blocked artery in his leg and um, the vascular surgeon who uh, did the amputation on him below the knee um, um, couldn't salvage the leg, obviously, and when he amputated, the flap died as well. So he called me um, and he said, what am I going to do with this patient? Uh, because um, this patient will um, uh, will lose his uh, the rest of his leg. So I said, well, let's do osseointegration integration surgery for him. And um, it was a challenging case because that's way stretching it there. Um, so uh, we did osseointegration, integration and you can see this picture over here um, that's a piece of bone sticking out um, uh, three and a half years down the track. And um, this patient, every time he go to his prosthetist, um, there is a, a visually impaired patient always with a minding dog, and the dog always tried to bite this bone, <laughs> basically. Um, but you can see this gentleman has his life back. Um, now, what we're doing is against nature. What we're doing is against um, a lot of things. One of them, this gentleman, um, uh, we are extending the life expectancy of these people. And um, um, it, the statistics shows that vascular patients, life expectancy is 12 months. 50% uh, of them pass, uh, pass away after 12 months. So, um, so that there is an ethical question here of um, should we start doing these cases or um, and give these people their life back or not? Um, then you get to a different level. Uh, again, there is something called conversion disorder, and um, and I see patients uh, that come to me uh, with their limb not not moving, not working at all, and. Um, um, and then objectively we do the assessment on them and uh, we put them through the psychological tests with psychologists assessing them, pain specialists assessing them, and multiple clinicians and we find nothing wrong with them. So, um, but they do believe that their limb is gone and it's not functioning. So, um, what do we do? Uh, do we provide them the amputation or do we not? Um, so um, if you do provide them the amputation, you're doing something, you're, you're amputating a limb that's normal, basically, but it's not functioning because the person doesn't believe it function, it's functioning. Um, if you don't provide them the amputation and they go out and then kill themselves, then who's responsible? Um, so that's, um, that's a really challenging question. I still haven't got the answer for it, but obviously I know what my peer thinks uh, about it. Uh, but it's, um, it's uh, who are we to judge these patients and who are we to, to decide for them? And then when you take it a step further, this is from the show, the movie, where the person uh, does not get the medical help, but then they go and do it themselves. And, um, and then they come to you, and I had 
patients who did that. Um, they couldn't um, uh, be provided with, uh, with the medical help. Uh, so they went and had a patient that went and had a circular saw and he amputated his limb and filmed it. And then he came and he said, well, I want help now. Then uh, what's the answer to that? So, and then you take it a step further. It doesn't get that easy, <laughs> does it? And then you face this kind of condition, okay? Um, and, and when it becomes a child, okay? And you know, I'll move away from the picture because it's really sad. Um, so this young kid, uh, she's four and a half, she had meningococcemia, and I know factually that if I give her a robotic arm, she will grow normal because the robotic arm will be integrated with her completely. But who am I to make a decision for her? The family is divided, half wanted, half doesn't. The medical fraternity is strongly against it. And we don't know, are we doing her harm by not doing anything, or are we doing her a favor by letting her grow with an amputation? Thank you very much. That's it, though. Mujid, thank you. I thought they were going to be graphic, but wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want you to take us back to when you, after you came to Australia and were released, and started to pursue, uh, for, firstly, orthopaedics, but then when you went into, because you're one of very, very few practitioners of osseointegration in the world, is that right? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, hopefully this will grow uh, bigger, but yeah. there are not many osseointegration surgeons in the world. So, and you learned it in Germany? Yeah, so after I finished um, my training here in Australia, went uh, and pursued my dream to achieve that, and Germany is the land where um, all technologies um, starts and develops, so, uh, so it is a German technology, and um, I went and learned it there. Then I came back and started it here. Started it here under the radar, to be honest, at mm. the beginning. <laughs> But then, but then, I mean, it, it's so funny, um, or not in a funny way, but uh, when, when I first did it, people laughed at me, and then when I did the first 10, I presented them in a national meeting, and then all of a sudden I got faced with many letters uh, written by so many people about how horrible this is, and uh, I'm gonna destroy um, the, a lot of people's lives, and, and then when we pro provided the evidence and, um, and proved that it does work, um, then um, the fight increased and escalated. And then when we passed the hundreds, then we started getting acknowledged. And now people are coming to learn it, which but is sad. What's given you the conviction then to be the, practically the sole practitioner in Australia and to find a team that will work with you and to carry on this work when you don't feel you've got the support of peers? Well, the problem is, I mean, I, I do believe in this technology, and I do believe in helping people, and I, I don't practice uh, uh, defensive medicine um, because that's the wrong way of doing things. Uh, um, and the way I see um, how uh, a lot of practitioners conducting themselves, and, um, um, and I'm very outspoken about this as well, as you can tell, um, um, it, it is very sad because that's kind of, losing the, the whole essence of being a medical practitioner, the whole idea, the whole ethos of medicine is to help people. And it's all built on trust, built on um, you know, uh, putting in, having faith in, in the fraternity. And, um, um, and the last thing we should do is that we, we treat patients as they are the enemy and, um, and act in the fear of being sued. Mm. Um, we are a medical, uh, medical uh, very litigious society, um, and that's, the whole West is the same, uh, but, uh, but I think it's very important that we keep medicine separated from, from that. Mm. So, um, so uh, to answer your question in a very long-winded way, uh, I do believe in what I, what I do, and uh, I do enjoy it, and, um, um, yeah. Otherwise, life is boring doing hip and knee replacement surgery. So how do you determine who is a candidate for this kind of surgery? Well, there is a very extensive process um, uh, for, for this kind of surgery. We still, I'm not that mad, uh, we still have, uh, I mean, the, the best way of practicing anything in life is to be surrounded by um, knowledgeable people that are expert in the field and um, and um, uh, share the opinions and the ideas. And um, I was very lucky that I managed to, to convince um, 
few elite um, uh, practitioners in the field that um, uh, this technology does make sense, and, and then they joined, and now we have a massive um, 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 like um, cohort of people um, that uh, um, run this uh, um, uh, center, basically, and it's growing bigger to become a unique um, uh, center in the world, basically, which is expanding to limbry construction and um, it doesn't exist anywhere else. I mean, definitely doesn't exist in Australia. There, there, there are similar smaller models in the UK and um, in, in Sweden, uh, but I think we'll be the world leaders in that field where um, we have multiple clinicians that um, sit together and make, uh, interview the patient, um, and the patient have different levels. Number one is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, assessment. Number two, where he, the patient get to see other patients who have this. Um, and now with social media, it's all over the, the place. You know, all you need to do is Google something and then everything pops out. And uh, it's not very hard to communicate with people who have similar conditions. Um, and uh, information is very accessible. Um, and that's, some people see that as danger. I see that as a huge advantage because um, empowering people with knowledge and uh, information make our life a lot easier because knowledge is all about um, uh, it's, it's all about how you make this process successful for the patient and the best way uh, to make it successful is by um, um, empowering the, the receiving person um, of this technology and I, I, I can give you an example um, I'm sorry, I moved away from no, your question, still but uh, <laughs> uh, um, but I, I remember one day in my early uh, childhood um, in medicine. Sorry, yeah, I was a junior doctor. Uh, okay, I was um, I was um, um, just about to perform surgery, uh, like a broken hip, on a patient, and um, and the patient was lying down, an elderly lady, very fragile, and her daughter was beside her, and. Um, and the daughter said to me, well, what are you gonna do? And I explained to her what I, was gonna, uh, what I was going to do. And she said, well, I'm gonna go and research that on, on the net. And I said, yeah, by all means, spend that time researching and then come back and ask me. And the Anisus was from a different generation. She said, no, that's rubbish. You should not um, uh, research anything and you should just listen to us because you'll fill your brain with um, um, all confusing information and you will not know what to do. And I totally disagree with that because we cannot um, disregard um, um, uh, people, and um, uh, and there is no one smarter than the other. And it doesn't mean that I have um, uh, learned few Latin words in in medicine that um, um, I know more than than a lot of people. And I learn a lot from my patients uh, uh, normally. So. Um, uh, so we have to understand that, and um, and I'm I'm a strong believer that um, um, uh, knowledge is the the answer to everything. Mm. So the decisions are made in a collaborative process with the patient and with their family members. And well, ultimately, the decision is made by the patient. We are here to serve the patient, and uh, that's there's no way around that. Uh, it has to be that way, and um, and we are a service provider. And I always say it like I'm here to serve people. I'm not mm. here to tell them what to do. Ultimately, if they want to do it, it's their decision, and all I can do is to help them to achieve that decision. I'm not. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't. I don't know what the future holds, but I know that um, the odds are, um, um, you know. Um, in certain conditions, we will we will achieve success. In other conditions, we will fail. And um, I see patients, and I hate to turn patients down, but um, um, like two days ago, I was running a clinic in Sydney, and I had a patient who was um, like um, who was very keen on having um, uh, a solution um, uh, for his problem, and and he was like um, um, very. Uh, passionate about having something done, and I said, "Look, I'm sorry. Um, if I touch you with this kind of procedure, uh, I will. Um, uh, you will end up dying, and uh, it's not going to work." Mm. Um, I'm curious about that in the sense that you know you, there is this whole process that you go through to have determined that a person is a candidate. But what are some of the things that that we might not? think about that you have to warn them about in terms of what it will be like to live with a robotic limb? Well, look, I mean, I mean funny enough, um, it, it, one of, the, one of the, the simplest things that people don't come across is that um, 
Is this going to be sharp? I'm going to live with a piece of metal sticking out of my leg all my life. Is this going to tear sheets? Uh, am I going to have normal, intimal relationship uh, with that? I mean, these are the things that are very simple, but they are very important. And um, um, because, after all, it's all about practical day-to-day -day, uh, life. And, and we go to these kind of details at that, uh, that level. And that's where we use peer um, um, uh, to peer consultation because um, there are patients who have been through this and they know they know it more than us and um, and that's where we learned and build um, the the information that we have at the moment and thanks to to the experience that we had with other people uh, basically and we're still learning life is all about learning do they need to be replaced well, look, t theoretically speaking, no, uh, because it's, um, there is no mobile parts inside. Um, the internal part doesn't need to be replaced, but the component externally and the connections, they, they have life expectancy. It's like any, anything. You replace a car, you replace a TV, you replace anything mechanical, and they do fail uh, with time, but, um, uh, but they are designed to be replaceable. But the implantable part, in theory, should last a lifetime unless it get uh, rusted with uh, an infection or uh, get hit by a car mm. and break. So at the moment, you're, mo you're working on upper limbs and lower limbs, but what's the potential? Because uh, I heard you in the earlier session talking about having an eye external to the body and that that was yeah, I mean, somewhat um, in progress. I mean, this is outside my field, but um, uh, ultimately, and in the future, we may get to a stage where a lot of our parts will be replaced by um, uh, computerized um, technology. And uh, if you see Futurama, uh, we may end up with a brain only and running everything. Um, I don't know how, f how much fun that would be, but... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, we do have the capacity now, and... Um, um, unfortunately, disasters and wars create innovations, and um, I know uh, certain countries are um, already inserting um, chips in people's brains to allow them to use wider field of vision and uh, more range of um, uh, waves so they can see in dark. Um, so that's happening already. Um, but um, um, And again, the technology that, that I'm using now um, Sadly, thankful to the to the wars, we can achieve it because co governments fund uh, uh, wars, fund um, destruction um, um, uh, tools, and they spend a small percentage on the disasters after that. And that small percentage is enormous amount of money um, that can fund these kind of innovative work. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, it is very sad because um, you know, with the price of uh, one uh, Pershing weapon, uh, one Pershing missile, or uh, one Abraham tank, you can um, build a hospital, basically. Mm. Yeah. I watched the foreign correspondent episode that you recorded at the end of last year, mm. was it, uh, with Sophie McNeil, where, where you went into Iraq, and I think performed something like 50 surgeries over five days, something... Yeah, I mean, now the, the number stands at 322, and um, so we went back again and again, but politics started getting in, and now I'm torn apart. I just received a phone call from the Iraqis, and one faction tells me that you're not allowed to work in the other hospital, and the other faction is telling me you're not allowed to work in the other hospital, and I said, What's, what are the repercussions? He said, you mm. don't want to know. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, Iraq is, uh, is a shithole, and it's going through a, uh, through another disaster time, and um, I'm sorry, I'm very politically incorrect, uh, but uh, but uh, you know there are riots outside and people burning stuff, but we have to go there and and do something because otherwise, what will happen? Mm. Um, so um, on average, when we go there, we operate between 10 and 16 cases a day. Um, so um, I try to go there every uh, every three months for a week and. Um, um, surprisingly, I have a lot of volunteers, um, 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 people who are very keen on, on going and not thinking of what could happen, but it is dangerous. Mm. I, and it's a funny question to ask, but I had pondered um, how much more life-changing an osseointegration procedure would be for an Iraqi who has been through... Uh, you know, who's been damaged by the war, unable to work and all. I mean, there was a huge amount of anguish in watching that 
foreign correspondent, yeah. as opposed to someone in Australia who has the support of the health system? Well, well that, that's the whole idea. I mean, my dream is to, to provide this technology to people who need it at most, people who cannot afford it. Uh, people like in uh, Cambodia, in Myanmar, in uh, Laos, in Iraq, um, uh, for a simple reason, because people over there, this technology, though it may sound very fancy, but it's very simple, um, and ultimately we can dumb it up, uh, dumb it down to to very, very um, uh, simple level, where I hope that by um, next 10 years, it will become less than $2,000 um, uh, technology, where um, tens of thousands of people can benefit from it. And uh, it does work. If it, if it works, it works perfectly well. And um, uh, places like these areas, um, um, resurfacing is very difficult. Like, we did a pilot study in Cambodia, and um, it's amazing how uh, when we went to this hospital, I mean, Iraq is a bit different because Iraq, it's in the middle. Uh, Iraq is very similar to the United States of America. Not so retarded, not so um, good, uh, but uh, it's, it's the same level. Um, uh, but Cambodia is, is a struggling nation where there is nothing, uh, basically. So we went to this hospital, it's called the Children's Hospital, and, um, um, and um, there was nothing, basically nothing. And, uh, and then I discovered that next door they have um, Angelina Jolie came in and, um, and volunteered um, um, a workshop to make silicons and, and, um, and, um, and sockets. So, um, so we had the implants that we brought with us from, uh, from Australia, but then we didn't have any legs to hook them up with. So um, we went to the shop next door and, um, and they make door hinges uh, like uh, and then, and then we managed to find some um, aluminium pipes, and with Angelina Jolie's feet, um, we managed to make a leg, basically. And um, and that was an amazing prosthetic limb for these people. And, um, and comparing to what they had before, they all rice farmers. They all submerged in uh, in muddy waters, and um, and with the traditional socket prosthesis. They cannot work. While with this technology, uh, that gives them the ability to function way superior with a door hinge, basically. Mm. So, um, so you can do that. Um, in and that limb would places. have a decent amount of longevity as well. Well, you can replace a door hinge. Uh, very easy. <laughs> Not by yourself. <laughs> have to wait for Dr. Munja to come back. <laughs> no, but but funny enough, we had uh, we had and it was it was amazing experience because we had um, 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 some prosthetic students from Ballarat University who were sitting there and and I came to them and um, and um, and it's funny um, uh, I said well we we're doing this can you help us and made some drawings and then we came up with this idea and it worked and then after that you can see the bureaucracy we went to the to the prosthetic center in the Penang Peng and um, and the guy who was sitting there who's in charge is a British person and he looked at us and he said and, and we said okay we've done these patients we just want you to follow them up and he said well we don't accept that and I said why he said we need state-of-art uh, brand new technology and I had some legs with me to donate um, and he said are these used and I said Yes, they are used. And he said, well, I don't accept used legs. We need brand new legs. And I said, you're an idiot. You know, uh, you know I used, used legs in, in Sydney, for God's sake. Uh, and, um, but that's, that's when, when, it, when you hit the roadblock with bureaucrats and government authorities. That's what you face, their, their, their arrogance. And, their, uh, and I face the same problem in Iraq. Uh, the Iraqis have the same issue. When, once it hits government, then everything become, turned mm. to pear shape. How challenging is it for you personally to be returning to Iraq on a fairly regular basis? Yeah, look, it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's madness because um, you, you don't know what will happen and and who would turn against you. I mean, um, and uh, you know, I try to keep my mouth shut, but I I never do. And uh, uh, and um, I was com com well, I confronted the the previous prime minister the other day in, in my last visit, and I had a big go at him. Uh, because he he walked out, he was in the hospital, um, and um, um, and um, and I said to him, well, I have all these people um, that need legs, and um, and you authorize the, the government authorized three and a half million dollars to uh, to buy legs for them, 
and the Ministry of Health took the money. And he said, well, no, this is not my problem. And I said, what are you talking about? You are the prime minister. These people lost their limbs because of you, fighting for you. And then people tried to kill him, basically. So he has a big army. So I don't know, maybe next time we go there, there might be someone waiting for us. But do you feel like that, genuinely? <laughs> not really. I mean, you live only once. Life is too short to think about the, these things. And, uh, and, you know, if you die tomorrow, then someone else will come and, and do something better. I mean, uh, look, if, if, if you go to Woolies, you may be hit by a car. So, um, uh, so the odds are. are I there like all your the time. chances at Woolies better, <laughs> <Yeah>. personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, tell me a little bit about what you think the propensity is for misuse of robotics, and uh, in terms of you know where that's going in the medical field and what how it might be used in a wrong way. Look, uh, I'm in the business of giving people their mobility back and, um, and bringing people as close as possible to physical normality. I'm not in the business of enhancement. However, enhancement will happen. And um, it is happening in many fields. And um, there are people who are utilizing technology to improve themselves uh, beyond. Uh, I mean, that has side effects and has the advantages and, and it's been um, going on in, with athletes um, for many years now, and we will see it. And um, it's not dissimilar to cosmetic surgery. It's not dissimilar to a lot of uh, practices that people do. Uh, people want to be perfect, and the way they look, um, they, they want to look perfect, they want to act perfect, and they want to, uh, you know, break a lot of records. Uh, do you think that our concept of what perfect is will change because we have access to this kind of technology? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the it, it's like anything with life. It's like any, any kind of technology. It, um, technology is moving very fast. So I don't know what the future holds, but definitely um, people tend not to accept what they have and they always want something better. Mm. And that's a human nature. Uh, but this is not my field. Yeah. Um, you talked about how some of your peers wanted to slow down the, the process to kind of just, just to pull it back a little bit. What did you mean by that exactly? Well, look, I mean, um, uh, in my previous panel talk, I, I mentioned that um, uh, medicine is very, um, very conservative. Uh, Australian um, uh, medical practitioners are very conservative um, and they practice safe. But then um, there is a question about where is safe. And, um, and sometimes um, um, uh, it's not always a good thing to, um, um, like, sometimes surgery is the answer. Uh, and sometimes surgery is a must. Um, and, uh, and people should be accountable for not choosing the right decision for the patient because the patient put their faith in the, in the clinician that's providing them the service. Um, and um, we learn um, in medical school is always use conservative approach and then you go to more in, invasive approach. And traditionally it's been thought that the, the invasive approach is using a knife and cutting. Um, that need to change because in many aspects, um, surgery can be the conservative approach. And um, it's all rel uh, relative and it's all um, 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 interchangeable based on the circumstances. Um, and, but there is the overall, like uh, uh, in my day-to-day -day work with hip and knee surgery, I get patients who are getting to 80-year-old with brittled with arthritis, can hardly walk, their heart has given up, their, their, their kidneys have given up, their lungs are not functioning well because they've been to doctors and surgeons who told them, I don't want to see you until you're crawling. And that's the wrong approach because you need to give the advice for the person based on the person rather than a blanket rule that you need to avoid surgery until you can't put up with, with the pain. Because what's the benefit of doing um, a knee replacement on an 85-year-old that has not much to live and they, they struggled with arthritis for 30 years. Mm. I mean, that's wrong. That's, that's not giving them the right approach mm. and the right decision. But you hear that all the time. And, um, uh, and it's, a, it's a generation thing. And, um, and uh, people can be less progressive than others. And um, 
So that's why uh, when we're talking about something way outside the box like OCA integration surgery, this is a, a blasphemy. Mm. And um, there are many examples of people being held on a stake and burned because of blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> You were using, citing an example of a diabetic patient um, in your presentation, and I wonder whether there is any kind of undertaking. This particular required. patient, the, the, the clinician who looked after him, said the words that this is madness. Right. Okay. But is there any requirement? Four years later, madness still alive. Yeah, still alive, still diabetic. Still, still vascular, so, still functioning. Th so there's no undertaking like required from the patient to say, I will make any lifestyle changes to maintain my health so that I'm, uh, you know, that I get 10 years out of this or any, anything like that. No, but, but statistically speaking, this person would be dead. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, mm. but um, that was uh, when, when we decided to do the, the case. I'll tell you the story about this patient, actually. It's very interesting. So, um, so he's a lovely guy, and um, I walked to the room. He's suing the hospital that missed, that, um, missed the popliteal artery and used him, so he's already taking a legal action. His son was standing there, who's a lawyer. His <laughs> other daughter, she was an ABC reporter, and uh, the, other, the, other, the other daughter was a doctor, and I walked in, <laughs> and then I told my prosthetist, we're going to do this, and that was the first case um, ever to be done in the world. That's worldwide, uh, okay? And, um, and, I, and the process says, I'm not doing this. Um, and, uh, and then I got to a stage where um, I had to um, come to the patient, and, and the patient said, look, I want it done, um, and I'm happy to sign a, a, um, a clearance that I would never sue the, the prosthetist. And I'll sign one for you. And I said, no, mate, don't worry. I don't, uh, I'm not worried about that because it doesn't wash anyway. <laughs> so, um, uh, but this kind of patient that, that I had to face in the first case in the world of its kind. And then we published the results of, um, of these uh, yeah. uh, patients. But again, they had, obviously, because they're a very intelligent family, they had an opinion from another person who said, this is madness, and then we ended up doing it. And doing it anyway. I, I think this is an appropriate time for me to ask the question about courage, because uh, I think as a surgeon, and maybe you take it for granted now, but uh, you know, it always fascinates me that the amount of courage and confidence that you need to have going into your daily work, uh, and, and probably particularly where it's groundbreaking daily work, is it something that you contemplate even? Well, look, it's, um, I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, I had so many sweet, sweaty nights and uh, sweaty pillows, and um, I, um, I, I used to sleep with my eye, one eye open all the time because, you know, you never know when you get the stab, the next stab. But um, um, life is all about, um, you know, leaving something behind and doing your best for people if you believe in it. Um, I'm not mad. Um, I practice medicine as safe as I can practice, and I, and uh, you know, life is all about risk. But as long as it's a calculated risk, and as long as you're measured, then you can push the wheel of uh, evolution further. And um, and, and you know, I'm, I've never chosen to have an easy life because this doesn't have any money or or anything in it, and it's very risky. And I still, um, you know, I talk about the wheel of fortune. And one day you're on top, the other day you're at the bottom. And um, people always say, well, you're now on the top. And I said, for the moment, because you never know what will happen. Because, um, you know, if I make a mistake or um, uh, have an error of judgment and things go wrong, uh, I might lose everything. Uh, but um, I do it because I believe in it. I do it because I know that I can make uh, people's life better. And I'll continue to do it. And, um, and I hope that there will be many people who would do the same. Mm. So when you speak about errors of judgment then, and I'm, I'm sure all surgeons must feel at some point in their practice that they've made those, is it something that you allow much time for reflection on? Or do you understand that that's a part of the role? Look, we are human being. The, the, the ultimate um, case would be a computer treating a computer. Nothing will go wrong, mm. OK? If a computer is treating a human being, that's less chance of error. If a human being treating a human being, many things can go wrong, OK? But um, um, what I've learned with life, if um, you do your best to make the right decision, and um, if things go wrong and you make a mistake, you admit it, and uh, you say, I'm sorry, and, um, and you promise that you'll fix it. Mm. And patients do forgive. 
What do you think that you learned or how, how I guess you were changed by your experience um, in coming to Australia and being in detention? How do you think that changed you fundamentally as a person? Well, look, I, I, was, I was a spoiled brat in Iraq. I, I was living in a bubble. I was complete, completely insular. I was a different person. And, um, and I think I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for Philip Product and the Department of Immigration that took me through all this hardship. Um, it did make me who I am. Um, uh, but the, you know, the way you, you grow up and the way you raise your kids uh, is, um, uh, is very important. Uh, I, I always uh, was told that look at the brighter side of things, look at the glass half, em half full, never look at the glass half empty, because life is too short and you live only once. Um, and you better uh, make uh, use of it and, uh, and leave something for yourself, leave something for your family, and what's more important, leave something for the community. And um, I think... Um, Is that what I, you said to yourself when you were in detention and didn't know how long you were going to be there for? Yeah, I mean, I had very tough times and I had very low uh, times. And uh, when I was in that box for 40 days and um, every, every day I asked, what am I doing here? They say, we're rehabilitating you. I was wondering when I'll, I'll, I would... Um, uh, leave or would would I ever leave? And um, um, and every day they come to me and they say, if you decide to leave, um, we will help you to go back. And, um, and and I said, well, I have nowhere to go, and uh, I'm here, I'm staying here. And I had a book on me, and I kept reading the book from cover to cover, and uh, which was Last Anatomy. And thanks again to the Department of Immigration, I scored very high in anatomy. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, having had that experience and then being able to c come to Australia, qualify, uh, you know, as an orthopaedic surgeon, why is it that you sought these new frontiers as opposed to, I mean, you'd be forgiven for wanting a quiet life? Uh, look, uh, it would be very boring, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, but, uh, but, hey, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm extremely grateful. Australia's home, Sydney's home. I'm sorry, I, I, I like Perth. I would never live in Melbourne, but uh, <laughs> sorry, I know you're from Melbourne. No, no, I'm from here. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, oh, sorry, you're from here. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to Australia, and, um, uh, and I'm very proud to be Australian. And, and, um, and, um, and the way I was brought up is that I have to give back, and, um, and that's why I have to give back. Mm. And it is, I mean, people think about Middle East and uh, people and these scumbags that are coming on boats, but believe me, there are a lot of good things about um, the way uh, some people are brought up, and uh, I was in a um, in a career seeker event, and um, an Afghani uh, young boy stood up, and um, and he said something very nice. He said, "The way I was brought up is that work is an honor, and um, and I have to find a job because if I don't have a job, that means I don't have an honor, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's how we were raised up, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, so it is important. And look." Um, Bottom line, we all have different colors and different you know, looks and brought up to different ethnic backgrounds and different faiths, but we share the same blood. Mm. Um, just going back to the technology itself, uh, does it change, it adapt much? Is it something that you have to keep on top of all the time? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the design that I had uh, 10 years ago is completely the design that I have at the moment. and. Um, um, it's like anything, uh, we continue to improve and um, there's a lot of investment. I mean, uh, uh, again, back, I believe in this and that's why I, I work, I still work doing hip and knees, uh, surgeries and joints so I can fund this project because I fund it from my own pocket and, um, um, and I'll continue to fund it. So, um, because we need to build it further and further, and uh, um, and and hey, now it's um, uh, it's bringing its fruits. Actually, funny enough, um, from a hobby and a passion about a ch uh, about making the Terminator as a child, now I have uh, the technology. The the German technology. We ended up buying the technology from Germany, and now we are exporting to Germany and 19 other countries. Uh, so um, so we are exporting now this technology to the rest of the world, and. Um, um, and we are the world. We became the world leaders in this technology. I'm very proud about this, and um, and and 
and I, I encourage that Australia um, invest in humans and um, because we should not keep thinking about what's under our ground because that will not last. Mm. And, um, 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 you know, um, it's, it's expanding and it's getting bigger and, um, and now it's making money, mm. basically. And are surgeons now coming to you asking to be trained in this process? Yeah, I mean, um, there is no week that passes um, um, that I'm, I'm much well known outside Australia than in Australia, but the prophet is never known in his own town. But that's that's a, that's a normal thing. That's a very normal um, uh, thing. But uh, uh, but now we're getting acknowledgement, and we have um, uh, local surgeons. Still, there is a lot of uh, skeptics. And um, uh, as I said to you, when one of my peer went to the extent that. Um, that says, oh, you know, is it true that um, that uh, in Iraq people cut ears? I mean, that's how stupid people can can. That they be. would want to discredit yeah, your I mean, reason. For, yeah. and, and that's the sad thing. Some people just hit below the belt line all mm. the time. Yeah. I feel like I'd, I'd love to um, offer the audience the opportunity to ask questions. Have you? Has anyone got a question? Yes. Or just is there a roving mic? Oh, I think I've got a yeah. loud Okay, it's for, for the recording, so just one second, if you wouldn't mind, please. Thank you. Just want to say that you're a remarkable human being. Having worked in the uh, health system as a registered nurse for 35 years, we need more doctors like you. Thank you. Keep Very it up. Thank you. And having worked in orthopaedics, and uh, nursed many people with uh, like amputees and you know with the pressure sores that they get and getting used to it and the phantom what I want to ask you is about the phantom pain do they still get the phantom pain yeah I mean um, that, that's another now we, we developed a new technology um, not me but um, it's been developed in um, in in Austria and uh, and now it's taken well, we took it and and the Americans took it and the Americans now are making American technology as usual like with anything else um, but um, uh, so we now rejig the nerves to give them something to do and um, and there is promising results with with that to, uh, to treat phantom limb pain as well. I, I had my first baby in 62 when thalidomide was uh, being given for morning sickness and uh, lucky for me I wouldn't take anything. Uh, have you had the opportunity or are you, because those people now are in their 60s, 50s, 60s, that, you know, it was terrible to watch them living without limbs. Were you able to help any of those people? Well, well we, we managed to um, uh, treat few congenital amputees, not particularly thalidomide patients. Uh, I haven't treated a thalidomide patient yet. Um, I, have a, I have an equivalent uh, case in Iraq that I'm going to treat a child, nine-year-old girl. Um, but, uh, but we've treated several uh, congenital amputees who are similar, uh, a similar situation. Mm. Another question? Oh, yes, sorry, I'm going to send you running all the way to the back on the far side now, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. I didn't realise that you'd actually been in clinic. You have a clinic in Perth as well, obviously. that was. Yeah, I do, I do come because I have a lot of uh, patients from Perth. For robotics? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Anyone in the audience? Some people may here in the audience. Yeah. May I? Oh, <laughs> glad I asked. <laughs> may, may I applaud you on a on a wonderful man you are. You're absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I sir. watched the uh, same correspondence program on TV, and that was amazing. So my question to you is: Have you ever heard of Noel the super vet? Yes, Noel um, uh, Fitzpatrick. Yeah. I had dinner with him just. Um, um, like a few months ago. He's a big womanizer. He was hitting on my, uh, on my girlfriend. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in, in a one-on-one -on -one interview, Noel yep. said that his dying wish would be for human surgeons, as he put it, to learn to from use that. his technology. Absolutely. Do you agree? Um, yes, I totally agree. I mean, I mean uh, I've known Noel for, for many years, and um, um, I'll tell you a story about Noel. He was, um, he, was, he was invited by Her Majesty to have dinner with her, and he broke his ankle just um, uh, during the period. So, so he went through making the suit and everything and, uh, to, fit, to fit his cast. And then when, when he sat, he was the only human being that headbutted the queen. 
so, so when they sat on the on the on the dinner table, he, as he sat, he kicked her 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 bag, and she went trying to grab it, and he went to, to grab it, and they had hit together. <laughs> That's Noel Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Are you prepared to have a chat with us? Sure. Would you, would you mind just bringing the microphone over to this gentleman who's a patient of Dr. Munjid's, please? Thank you. Hello. What's your name? My name's Jolyon. And, and Jolyon, tell me about your relationship with Dr. Munjid. Um, so I had heard about OCO integration and started doing the usual internet research on it and was a bit nervous. I'd been an amputee for over 30 years, so I was very familiar with sockets and that kind of technology and what the limits were and what I could do. Um, and then as a baloney amputee, it's harder in some ways um, to get a good result from osseo integration mm. just because of the shape of the bones. And so I did a lot of reading and a lot of research and finally met Munjid and decided, what the hell, have a go. How's it gone? Uh, it's been less than a year and the results are frighteningly good. <laughs> <laughs> and immediate? Is it an, an immediate kind of response? Uh, you've got a long recovery period where you're walking with crutches and just gradually building up your strength and, and ability to walk as the bone and the titanium integrate. So it's a slow process. Mm. I remember you saying that the, it's, it's better, you get a better result from above knee amputation, don't you? Yeah. No, no, no. Oh. And no, no. Actually, um, from an above knee, you give them their mobility back. From below knee, you give them their leg back. Is uh -huh. that right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, so if baloney works, it's absolutely superior to anything mm. else. So what Julian is saying is that the rehabilitation, we have very strict rehabilitation protocol because uh, with baloney, the, the, below the knee, the tibia is pyramidal shape and it's a reverse pyramid. Uh, while the implant, you have to put it from the bottom. So it's very challenging to, uh, to decide the size and the shape and the technology of the implant. And, they, and because I'm the only one who's doing baloney amputees in the world, um, so I don't have anyone to learn from, uh, basically. Well, above knee, the technology has been uh, there for a while, and we learn from the Germans, and we learn from their mistakes. But from below the knee, we 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 started it basically. Mm. Um, so um, so the we are much more cautious with it, uh, but definitely once it works, it's brilliant. Mm. So are you glad you went ahead then, Jolyon? So far, so yeah. absolutely brilliant. Amazing. Thank you so much. Do you have any further questions? Eva? Oh, yes. No. Um, gentleman up the front here, please. And then we have another lady on the front as well. Oh, they come thick and fast now. We have three minutes to go. Uh, Dr. Mujit, you, you mentioned just now that uh, you had to fund this work yourself. I'm just curious. Aren't there any grants from the government to fund something that's so, you know, cutting edge? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, that's a very, very good question, actually. We, we are applying now for grants. Um, funny enough, we have 7 million euros grant from the European Union. We have 4 million uh, US dollars from the Department of Defense from America. And, um, and finally, we have a grant um, uh, 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 an uh, ARCT grant from, um, from the Australian government of uh, $4 million to build a, a, a centre. But, um, uh, but there is a lot of red tape and there are a lot of um, things that goes around grant. I'm trying to build a manufacturing facility because uh, we still outsource the manufacturing in, in Australia and, and I was told that I should go to Brisbane, it's much easier, or Adelaide, because New South Wales government is much more restricted. Mm. Basically, so there is a lot of politics here. Mm. Um, um, there's another question in the. Fr oh, oh, you here now? Sorry, won't be a moment. Uh, hello, sorry, you can't see me, but uh, I have two questions. I'll be fast. One is, um, how much will it cost to do anything like this, and will the Medicare kind of pay for it if it's the right decision? And the second one is, um, uh, what's the hardest thing of this pr procedure? Is it like? Um, 
I guess your body rejects the implant, or is it more about the technology, or just how to implant it? Yeah, look, um, uh, the, um, it is, uh, there is MBS code, and there is Medicare rebate for it. The external component, uh, there are different bodies that supply it now. If, if NDIS uh, um, offer a certain level of, uh, of funding, and there are components that are not funded. Uh, but the implant is covered by Medicare, the external components covered by NDIS or your um, um, organization, depend on the state. And, um, um, but um, to, uh, depends on what you want. For the, for the external component, if you want a Rolls-Royce kind of um, robot, um, the government wouldn't fund it. But NDIS cover, cover reasonable kind of uh, components that is functional. Um, so um, we are lucky to be in Australia uh, with, uh, with, um, with the technology that is, um, uh, a lot of it is, is, is funded and covered. Um, if you um, come from overseas, definitely they have to pay. Majority of, um, uh, the, nearly 50% of my patients are international patients and, um, and it costs them like $110,000. Um, um, but Australians doesn't cost that much. Uh, mm. it's, it's much cheaper. Mm. Um, obviously, the surgical fees and other fees that are outside uh, the, uh, the, um, the funding, uh, like anything else. Um, now, the hardest thing is the decision making. Um, the, um, the implant is made out of titanium, um, and it's coated with nanoparticles. So, um, and there are some other um, technologies in it that are patented um, that, that I can't disclose. But, uh, uh, but, um, but um, it, there is no rejection. Um, of the body, there is a risk of infection, obviously, but that goes down as time go by. Thank you. And one final question in the front front here. Yeah. Um, my colleague has got a sore throat, so I'll be voicing for our client. Um, absolutely amazing! What an incredible job! Thank you for coming to Australia. I'm glad fate brought you here. I wanted to ask you. <clears throat> I'm very interested to know. With other doctors over in Europe, um, are they lining up to learn from you? Are you going to become a professor yeah. of medicine that you're that you're doing? Or? So, so we, are, we, we, I am a professor of medicine. <laughs> um, so, so, but uh, with um, uh, with European doctors, so we have many centres now. We have uh, two centres in the UK, or a third centre. One, uh, a third centre is opening in Scotland. Um, um, and we have two centers in Holland, we have um, uh, two centers in Germany, Spain, uh, Italy's opening up, and um, uh, so there are many countries um, in, in Europe uh, that uh, are very uh, interested in Turkey. Uh, we've done cases in Jordan, Lebanon, uh, we've done 98 cases in Iraq, um, and uh, even the Americans are getting it now. I've done, uh, um, I've done three cases in New York in hospital special surgery, and um, uh, we've done um, cases in Canada as well. So, um, so I'm spending most of the, my time traveling around the world mm. uh, doing it yeah. and teaching people. Yeah. And in Australia? Yeah, I mean, in Australia, we have more than 600 cases mm. done. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Mujid, the theme of the entire Disrupted 2018 has been about the melding of humanity and technology, and I think you very ably brought us to a very inspiring conclusion today. Thank you for being here. Please thank, thank Professor me. Mujid al Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks to you, uh, Mary Faiton, as well. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for our <laughs> guests today. Look, that brings us to the end of Disrupted Festival 2018. I want to thank you all so much for coming along. I've got a few quick thank yous to go. If you want to leave, you can go. That's all right. Just, just, just so you're not left there on the stage. Big round of applause once again. Before you all rush off, I'd just like to have a few thank yous just to uh, the people that have put this whole festival together. First of all, our Auslan interpreters who have been here all weekend. They've done every session and signed some very strange words along the way. So they've done a fantastic job. Big thank you also to the State Library of Western Australia who have put the whole event together. All of our speakers and panellists, of course, who have come along uh, and spoken to you all over the last couple of days. I want to say a big thank you to all the crew that have done all the sound and the video and all the things that are here today uh, that enable us to go and watch videos and be heard and all those sort of things. There's a whole bunch of volunteers as well that have donated their time to help uh, the people throughout the 
the library. Um, big thanks to GM Consulting, so Georgia and Rachel and Jess and all the team there who have put all the program together and done all that sort of stuff. And also, I want to be, say a big thank you to all of you for coming along as well, because if we don't have audience come along to these kind of events and support the library and support these kind of things, then they just won't happen anymore. So thank you all so much for coming along, and hopefully we'll see you again uh, next year. Don't forget you can have a look at the live stream, which is available for the next few days on the website. So make sure you check that out and you might be able to see yourself. And you can also pass it on to people who may not have been here and be listening to some of the fantastic talks that we've had here today. So once again, thank you all so very, very much, and hopefully we'll see you again next year. Bye-bye.